Uh, well, good morning. It's the 11th of February, 2024, and uh, we're in the house of God. We're looking at the Word of God, and I'm in Luke 17, and that's page 1035, Old Bible, 1466, New Bible. Let me just pray. And the subject this morning is faith. And I want to talk about the faith that heals totally. Heals totally. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you, Lord, for that which your spirit puts into our hearts. A certainty about the truth concerning our maker and his word. And so this morning, Lord, we want to hear from you, not from man. And I pray, Lord, that everything that comes from this passage will be inspired by you. Amen. I'm reading from verse 11. I'm in Luke 17, uh, page 1035, Old Bible 1466, New Bible. I'm reading from verse 11. It came to pass that as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. As he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? There are not found that that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Faith that heals totally. Faith that makes whole. Now, now what is faith? What is faith? Well, it's believing in God. And, um, and believing in what God has said. That's faith, isn't it? But it, that, that's kind of general. That's no good, is it? It's me putting my trust in God and my trust in in what he has said. That's real faith, isn't it? That's the faith that will do something for the human soul. All they did, the other nine, well, ten of them, was cry to God for mercy, and they were healed. And I want to just look at the simplicity of getting that healing. It's so simple. I'm in Romans 10, page 1126 and 1593. And I'm looking at verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. It's the word of faith which we preach. Wouldn't it be good for them to hear the preaching of those first apostles? What a blessing. But what a blessing that we have on record the ministry of those men. We know what they said. We know their doctrine. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich to all that call upon him. And this links me in with the fact all they, those lepers did was cry for mercy. This verse links that to this. Whoever, for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's very simple, isn't it? But how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach? except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel and bring glad tidings of good things. You get that simple mechanism for the salvation of your soul. 
confessing the Lordship of Christ, well, making him Lord, obviously, not, not good just paying lip service, and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. The importance of the resurrection cannot be overstated. The literal, physical resurrection of Christ is uh, an, in, it's absolutely um, inextricable from saving faith. They are linked together totally, and I don't want to go there now, but uh, particularly 1 Corinthians 15, that great chapter on resurrection. And he says, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, you are still in your sins. It is that important. But they've got to hear the gospel, and someone's got to be sent to tell them the gospel. And um, the Samaritan, though, he has more than the others. I'm going back to uh, Luke 17. All of them have cried for mercy. They've all received mercy. But the Samaritan has something else. And I want to look at what I've called the essences, maybe the essentials might be better, of real saving faith. And starting with this guy, and I'm going to look at some other scriptures, supreme, overwhelming gratitude. Gratitude. They'd all been healed of their leprosy and headed off, I suppose, to the priests. He turns back in verse 15, and back in Luke 17, with a loud voice, he glorifies God. You know, I'm very conservative and maybe my culture, my race, I don't know, but I think it's very good at times to say to God in a loud way, thank you, I love you. What you've done for me is tremendous. And I'm going to express it. And it's good to express it with a really good song of worship, isn't it? So important, friends. Gratitude. I'm looking at the essences of real faith. Gratitude. And um, you, it's, it would be based, in his case, on every saved soul's case, on an, on an awareness of the awful nature of the disease that I had. Leprosy, well, thank God it's curable now, but that was the end of you. If you got leprosy in those days, that was it. And what a horrible end, you know. The body gradually rotting, on, rotting away on, as, you, as you stand, almost. And it is a, in Scripture that certain things are a picture of other things, aren't they? Leaven, the yeast, is a picture of how sin is all-pervasive. And you get that idea of a loaf of bread as you're making a loaf, and it starts to swell, doesn't it, once the yeast is in? You know, it's touched the whole thing. And leprosy is a picture of sin. It's a very good picture of sin. Because it often starts, it does usually start with a loss of sensitivity. The first symptom, a loss of sensitivity. Where he, he touched the fire, he didn't feel it. Oh, something's happened. A loss of sensitivity. Doesn't sin do that, friends? I had a sharp conscience. I kept breaking what it was saying to me and, and it went quiet. In the end, I didn't listen to it at all. Sin, a loss of sensitivity. I had a longing for God, but I couldn't seem to find him. Well, then you should have sought him with all your heart. But the desire diminished. And you learn to live with that. A loss of sensitivity. And when, when that disease has been taken away, you're going to shout with a loud voice, aren't you? Thank you. What a change. What a change. Another reason for that overwhelming gratitude is when we know the price God has paid to set us free from that disease. Just, look, just looking at Gethsemane and then Calvary and what Christ did that we might be set free from that disease. And 
And can I just say this? And I want to go to 1 Thessalonians 5, please. That's page 1177, 1665. That when you are in that frame of mind, really so, from within, it, it, ends, it ends all your complaining. Whatever your difficulties and troubles are, they are put into a different kind of category, if you like. They're no longer dominant. Because compared with what God has done for you, they don't mean much. And then the other thing too, when you belong to the Lord, the, the certainty that all things do work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 the certainty of the truth of that scripture is very much a part of real gratitude. It's very much a part of it. 1 Thessalonians 5. Um, let's try and find it. And I, the, the, the last part of the first letter to the church at Thessalonica, I mean, you've got this sort of almost like a staccato, boom, 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 instructions, you know. I love the way this chapter ends um, and I'm going to look at a couple of them but I, I want to look mainly at 16 to 18 but um, verse 15 see that no man render evil for evil never want revenge, never rejoice evermore pray without ceasing in everything give thanks this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you in everything give thanks you'll do that when you know how much God loves you. And you know that all things are under his control and all things work together for your good. You better thank him for everything. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Pray without ceasing. It's an instruction, isn't it? One, I can't remember which one it was, but one of the old apostles, might have been in the Welsh Revival, whenever he met anybody, he said, do I find you praying, brother? Are you praying, brother? Every time he met anybody. Pray without ceasing. That constant turning to God about everything. It's full of, that is full of life, you know. It's full of life. Quench not the spirit. People can do that, and you, you can, can do so much... Um, damage to what God wants to do and we're not, we're not to quench the spirit despise not prophesying prove all things hold fast that which is good abstain from the all the appearances of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit, soul and body may be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ going back to the essentials of faith and back in chapter 17 of Luke faith through obedient uncomplaining service obedient uncomplaining service and at the beginning of the chapter well, in, in verse 5 is that the apostle when they've been told you've got to forgive all the time no matter what people do just keep forgiving the apostles say increase our faith and he says, Lord, the Lord said, if you had a faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'd say to this sycamine tree, be plucked up by the root and planted in the sea, it would obey you. But which of you having a servant, ploughing or feeding cattle, will say to him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meat, and won't rather say to him, make ready wherewith I may sup, gird yourself, serve me, till I've eaten and drunken, then you can have your supper. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when you've done all things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. I want to just unpack that a little bit. First of all, when they say increase our faith, he doesn't say, right, guys, sit down, I'm going to lay hands on you to you know, impart the gift of faith. He says, look, learn to live a life of duty, obedience, without wanting a pat on the back. And then when you've done what I've told you, minister to me. Been working all day in the field. You come here now, get my supper. 
And I see that as a real pattern of Christian service. Doing what God wants uncomplainingly and then worshipping him, ministering to Christ, an essential of faith, because they've said increase our faith. Faith that drinks from the divine fountain. Revelation 22. And verse 17. Right, this is a marvellous piece of scripture, I think. The, 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 verse 17. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, and the bride, the true church, say come. Let him that hears say come. Pass on the invitation. Let him that is a thirst come, and whoever will... Let him take the water of life freely. Freely. And the preceding chapter, where it's similar, but something is added. I mean, in Revelation 21, I'm in verse 6 and 7. He said to me, It is done. <clears throat> I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is a thirst. There's the, that's the. Only qualification, it seems, in both of those passages. And it's, it echoes what the Lord said at the last day of the feast, you know, in John 7, uh, verses 37, 38, 39, I think. You know, the, the, if any man thirst, come to me and drink. Come to me and drink. And this spake he of the Spirit. And out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Something supernatural. That is more than you could ever muster. Or, or, or create or manufacture because it's from God and you got it because you were thirsty for God and that was the qualification but then you, there's something to be added um, he that at verse 7 he that overcometh shall inherit all things an element an essential of faith overcoming getting the victory and I will be his God and he should be my son. I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled when I, when I read that verse. It's thrilling. And, but there's, we've got to overcome. It's an essential of faith. And I want to look at an example. And then I'm going to read something from Pilgrim's Progress. But in Mark 2, page 985 and um, uh, 1395, We know those very familiar scriptures we look at often enough about getting victory over Satan. Um, this is more over circumstances, or Satan engineers circumstance, anything to keep you away from God. But uh, and, and in that um, passage in Revelation 12, you know they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. You know they knew that their souls, all that guilt, all that accusation. Their souls were free of that guilt because Christ had died. And, and it was a reality that they could confront the accuser with. And the word of their testimony, they knew what God had done for them. And they could say it, as can every Christian. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They had, and every Christian has to do this, they have yielded up the right to their whole being to God. Dispose of me as you choose. But here you get... Um, an overcoming an example of it. I'm in um, Mark 2. Uh, when he entered into Capernaum, reading down to verse 12, a bit of a reading, and straightway many gathered together insomuch there was no room to receive them, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word to them. They came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, paralyzed, which was born of four. Four friends were carrying this man. When they could not come nigh him for the press, the crowd... They uncovered the roof where he was, cupped a roof, they break the roof, and they'd broken it up, they let down the bed where in the sick of the palsy lay. Jesus saw their faith. Faith is an act, isn't it? It's an action. And um, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Well, that's, that's worth a sermon, isn't it? Now they thought he needed healing, he needed forgiveness. So many times we look at a person's problems and circumstances and we pray about those, but what they actually need is deliverance from the guilt that, is, that taints everything. 
And they were certain of the, certain of the scribes' reasoning in their hearts. Why does this, this man speak blasphemies? Only God can forgive sins. Immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise, take up thy bed and walk, but that you may know, I love this, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He says to the sick of the palsy, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, go your way into your house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, went forth before them all. In fact, they were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. They, there's an element of faith which is just like what these guys do. They, they, they break through all barriers. Now, how easy it can go. There's, there's too many. We're never going to get in. Look at the crowd around the door. We're never going to get in. We'll take him back and maybe we'll find the prophet again another day. You know, it, they knew they had to break through. And, it, and it, it's an amazing picture, isn't it? They get up on the roof and they start breaking the roof. And it, it's not very discreet. It's probably not even legal. But they've got to break through. And there's an element to faith which is just like that. And they won't be put off. They won't be put off. Uh, um, friends, we've, we've got to have that spirit, friends. And if you haven't got it, ask God to give it to you. And he will, definitely. He definitely will. The things that I ask God for, you know, that, and um, we could naturally, none of us have enough, friends, naturally. None of us. One example with Peter. You know, he was a mighty, powerful, determined man who loved Christ. Really loved him. And uh, the Lord said, oh, oh, you're all going to desert me. I, I will go to prison and to death with you. And he really meant it. And as far as natural things go, he had the courage and the zeal and the love, as far as natural things go, and ben, but he is destroyed. Satan has desired to have you to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. And he comes through that and he gets the victory where he lost the battle. He does face and go through a martyr's death. The thing that he couldn't, couldn't face is just where he gets the victory later on. And that's what the Lord will do. If we haven't got that courage, that zeal, that determination, or that perception of the importance of things, ask God to give it to you. He definitely will. I'm going to read from two articles from Pilgrim's Progress. Um, this is the house of the interpreter. I saw the, the, the interpreter interpreter took him by the hand and led him to a pleasant place. There was a stately palace, beautiful to behold, at the sight of which Christian was greatly delighted. He also saw upon the top thereof certain persons who were clothed all in gold. Then said Christian, may we go in there? The interpreter took him and led him up toward the door of the palace. And behold, at the door stood a great company of men as desirous to go in, but durst not to afraid. There also sat a man at a little distance from the door at a table side with a book and an inkhorn before him to take the name of him that should enter therein. He saw also that in the doorway stood many men in armour to keep it, being resolved to, 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 to do to the men that should enter what hurt and mischief they could. In a powerful opposition, intending to hurt us if we mean business with God. Now Christian was somewhat amazed. At last, when every man started back for fear of the armed men, Christian saw a man of very stout countenance come up to the man that sat to write, saying, Set down my name, sir. The which when he'd done, he saw the man draw his sword, put on a helmet, rush toward the door, and against the armed men, who laid into him with deadly force. But the man, not at all discouraged, fell to cutting and hacking most fiercely, so that after he'd received and given many wounds, to those that attempted to stop him, he cut his way through them and pressed forward into the palace, at which there was a pleasant voice 
heard from those that were within, saying, even of those that walked upon the top of the palace, saying, come in, come in, eternal glory, thou shalt win. So he went in and was clothed in such garments as then as they. Then Christian smiled and said, I think verily I know the meaning of this. Now there's one last thing which I can't resist reading where this is the, the home kind of, I hope you've read this Pilgrim's Progress. If not, get a copy and read it. It's, it's almost timeless. And um, Valiant for Truth has been called home, the summons to go home. And um, that is to heaven. And he said, I'm going to my father's, though with great difficulty I'm got hither. Yet now I do not repent me of all the trouble I've been to arrive where I am. I, I've written this down at home. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage. And my courage and strength, my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I fought his battles. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage and my courage and skill to him that can get it. An essential of faith, breaking through the barriers, friends. I am not going to be put off. I am going to follow Christ. It doesn't matter what's against me. Or who's against me? Or if I'm on my own. I'm following Christ. And I'm going to battle through. Come what may. That's an element of real faith. And then trusting Jesus. And I want to finish with this. And really an element of real faith is trusting him. And um, I think one area which is incredibly common as a deterrent is the sense that if I give myself to him, my life's going to be impossible. The consequence will be unbearable. And it made me think of, I think I might mention this at the prayer meeting yesterday, uh, that I got from Nelson. Um, oh, goodness me. China Nan missionary, Hudson Taylor. Said it's like a girl. In those days, of course, a real patriarchy. Once a girl was married, she pretty was the property of her husband. Eh? You would run her life. She said, I can't give myself to that man because, in case when I'm in his power, he's going to be, he'll turn out to be a tyrant. What a terrible, actually, very slanderous view of Christ. And how wrong. How wrong. So if I become a Christian, he might send me to China. He won't send you to China. He will take you to China and you'll be full of joy. Because he's there and all the supernatural things he intends for your journey will be in place. So it's, it's a completely different perspective when we know about the love of Christ. And I say, um, we say, well, we can risk trusting. It's not a risk. Trusting him isn't a risk. Nothing could be better. So I'll go back to my reading. And um, what a lie, though, from the author of lies. What a lie. You don't give yourself fully to Christ. Life will be awful. What a lie. From the, from the father of lies. So I'm reading again in Luke, and just to, about this man who, whose gratitude moved him. And we, let's be like that, friends. Let's be so thankful to God that it moves us. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God, and fell down at his feet, giving him thanks. He was a Samaritan, a foreigner. Jesus said, well, where's the nine? Where's the, weren't ten cleansed? Where's the nine? And they found one to give glory to God and, and just this stranger. And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. My, my title, Faith That Heals Totally. Thank you.